stream and roar for being part of the symposium and of course looking forward to your session but you'll have to just tell us a little bit about yourselves and then we'll go into language and mediation so reem you want to just a little sure bit thing. about you yeah. so i'm reem al qari obviously from egypt from turkey from all over actually um uh, i am a language uh, expert as you can say uh, i was a medical interpreter for uh, and qualified legal interpreter for around 8 actually 9 years now and now we uh, have a i have my business in language services where we provide interpretation and cultural adaptation and other language solutions for our clients uh, i'm originally a clinical pharmacist so i have a very mixed background here um and um thank you so much vikram and roar for the invitation here uh, i'm i'm really happy to be here thank you so much thank you thank you reem and of course roar said that you're a language expert and you should be part of the symposium i said <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for bringing that part that, that voice into this uh, a very interesting conversation actually i've watched some and it's really interesting to mediation is a very fascinating concept it's a day to day concept not only uh, when conflict happens you know it's a way to avoid conflict too if you have it as a skill set a part of your skill set and interpreters are not um not strangers to this uh to this world so i'm glad that i'm bringing this voice into the conversation that's a very important voice and if, as we go along we'll get to know how important that is and yeah. so roar please hello everyone uh, my name is roar veger i'm living in oslo norway and i work as a facilitator i've been working as a lawyer for several years and then 6 years ago i started my own company veger negotiation institute where I do negotiation training advising sparring coaching and and mediation um a lot of lectures and that's another place where I met uh, Reem and I thought this is part where we connect and then when Vikram came with this symposium I thought it was a very convenient time to us to do something together to see the collaboration and the importance uh other two fields that both from the mediation sector know more about the linguistics approach and and thoughts and knowledge and vice versa so um, i'm looking forward and look when i put out the topic i also do i still don't know where all this can go i said let's put the topic out and i always do that of course let's have a broad topic let's start a conversation we don't know what's going to come in because the thing was a lot of people were asking me what do you expect i said oh, no there are no expectations <laughs> let it go where it has to go and interesting things will come out so i don't know of course you said green that you had had a look at some sessions and everyone's got their own interpretation they brought in interesting thoughts and i really like that so it's all up to you i am a spectator i won't say mute spectator because i won't put myself on mute maybe <laughs> but please it's your show i'll come in bring me in whenever you want so reem maybe you can start and yeah, let's go into language and mediation okay so actually when we started the company, when roar invited me uh and we started having our uh back door conversation uh we were talking about the uh, the concept where the interpreter uh the roles of the interpreter because uh, as an interpreter you to be a good one you need to be an invisible party in the conversation and how can you achieve that when you are in a mediation situation where already there is expectations by the clients coming in and expectation by your mediator who might be your client um so this challenge of the role boundaries is one of the most hot topics actually uh, in uh, in uh, in the mediation conversation how to remain impartial and biased Uh, and when to step in and be an advocate so as an interpreter you uh, you wear multiple hats you're an advocate you're a cultural broker you're a conduit you're a a, cl- uh, a clarifier so uh, when does uh, one role ends and the other starts and when do you step out of boundaries is what we think is the most important part to talk about uh, and role can here also shed a light on that with me yeah Uh, because uh, the, the challenge sitting in a multicultural multilinguistic uh, negotiation or mediation um 
and and speaking my own language, or should I speak as Norwegian will be, or should I speak English? Uh, is that a, a, an advantage for me to to speak my own language and then ask one of Reem's interpreters to come and join me in this meeting because I, of course, will be more fluent in Norwegian, my mother tongue, than in English. Or should I depend on um, Reem's colleague that is uh, that both uh, Vikram and I can use together uh, to interpret I learned the difference between translation and interpretation. And I did a lecture in, in Russia some years ago that I pointed out really well. Uh, so it's it's many dilemmas uh, from the mediator, negotiator's point of view, um, how, to, how to use the interpreter and how much should I know you and you know me and how much do we need to know about each other's field to be able to do this role in a very good sense. And then when you touched on, on the role and the boundaries of the role, uh, it's really an interesting, um, uh, some challenges that we, that we can reach. So um, when we spoke yesterday, uh, and I like Reem when you talk about the boundaries, um, can't you tell everyone, uh, excuse me, uh, about the role of the interpreter when Jimmy Carter was visiting Japan? I thought that was a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. So President uh, Jimmy Carter uh, was giving this lecture in Japan uh, many years ago. And uh, there is this interpreter who actually I think of in a lot of situations when I'm in an advocacy conundrum. Uh, the, the, the president started his uh, speech with a joke. And then the audience burst into laughter. So the president was so fascinated by what happened uh, that he asked the interpreter after the speech, and uh, what did you say in, Jap in Japanese when you're, when you're speaking English, there is at least a 20% uh, expansion in the language. So it should have taken longer, but that didn't happen. So then the president was really interested. You said it really fast and everyone laughed. What did you do? Are you that good of an interpreter? But uh, so the interpreter cornered and obliged to answer after like the president kept asking him. And he said, I said, the, uh, the president said a joke, please laugh. <laughs> and the audience burst into laughter. You know, we want to avoid any political issues here. So the audience burst into laughter. This, this topic was actually, is always been, this uh, situation, sorry, has always been studied. Was he here? a cultural broker, an advocate, or did he cross a boundary? So most people lean towards crossing the boundary uh, because you did not convey the message. But the jokes and the, uh, the this, the, there's this part of the culture that you cannot just relay in another language and it get lost in translation. And this happens a lot, I think, in mediation, you know? So keeping it neutral, language neutral and as culturally neutral as possible is very important to keep the conversation intact, you know? And he crossed the boundary because he didn't do that. He should have, but it would have, it would have, it could have caused a political issue, you know? And I myself, actually, I was telling Gloria about a story that I faced myself, and it's still also a topic that um, is a controversial part uh, in advocacy, where I, as a, as a medical interpreter, it happened to me where there was someone on the call, and uh, they had a patient, they had a daughter, a nine years old, who was sick. And that daughter, uh, in our culture, um, sometimes it's perceived as being sick, that you are not uh, fit for marriage anymore. So we don't want people to know. So when that, ha when that happened and they were talking to the nurse practitioner and the nurse practitioner stepped out of the room, uh, the parents started talking because again, as a good interpreter, you're supposed to be invisible. So I was too invisible for them. They forgot I was there. And they started talking about how, uh, how are they gonna conceal this piece of information from her school, from her surroundings, all in all. And this harms the patients, from my point of view, because I come from a medical background, this harms the patients, uh, this put her in danger. So I felt obliged as an advocate to my patient that I need, uh, when the nurse practitioner comes back, I need to let her know everything that happened. 
And I did that and it spiraled and they called child uh, protective services. They took the daughter away and it went on for months. But here, was I an advocate or did I cross my role boundary? This is, the, this is how complex it could get because if I was on site, and this is also another difference, if, you're, if your interpret, interpreter in mediation is on site with you in the room, when you step out, they step out. So it's easier, it's more manageable. But as an over the phone or, re, or remote interpreter, so I'm there on a phone or in a video call, I'm in the room, they don't take me out. So I can hear things. So should I say or should I not? I think these, uh, these, uh, these questions is better answered by the preparation part. As Rohr said, we need to get to know each other. I need to know what's your expectations. I need to know what's your problem, what's your topic. What are you trying to achieve uh, with, uh, with, your, uh, with your clients? The preparation part and the setting of expectation uh, is a very crucial part because you want to you want to choose your interpreter that suits your personality, suits your own personality because you want your personality to show in the negotiation part and the mediation part, and not uh, not their their traits, not their culture only, not their language only. It's a combination of of uh, criteria that you need to to choose upon uh, when you choose an interpreter. Yes. And when you do that, Reem, uh, you are there to interpret uh, what I bring to the table and come across. And I'm trying to work out a deal with the other party. How much are you then um, uh, fully aware of all, everything that's going around? Because I have a, a friend uh, working for the State Department. And he was asked to, to step in and interpret uh, a conversation uh, quite in a hurry between uh, two foreign ministers. And when he reflected afterwards, he could not, almost not remember uh, anything about the content because he had been so focused on the interpretation. So when he then was asked afterwards, what did they talk about? It was kind of, out of his mind. Um, and, and we have seen some examples uh, where, you know, the question have come up afterwards. Um, we have some examples uh, regarding um, Donald Trump uh, uh, speaking with President uh, Putin earlier and, and, it, and the interpreter was asked to relieve uh, her, her notes and papers and also maybe witness to the Congress. Uh, so what, how much do, do you remember of the content when we are finished? If you are asking me personally, I am uh, most of the time on autopilot. For me, it's, uh, it has become my, uh, how my brain is wired. So not every bilingual or multilingual is an interpreter. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of new skill sets that you introduce to, to get your mind wired to jump from one language to the other instantly, be it a simultaneous or a consecutive. Simultaneous is harder, but simultaneous or consecutive, you have to change the message right away in your brain. So I'm a person who operates and I, that's how I train my interpreters. You operate on a need to know basis. Your brain is not meant to retain information. It, it's meant to relay information. And the notes as part of our policy and uh, our legal compliance, we're supposed to shred everything the moment the day ends. We're not supposed to keep anything because we handle a lot of very sensitive information, social security numbers, uh, people's identities, credit cards, a lot of things that you cannot uh, retain. And I don't retain it in my mind. I had a lot of stories, a lot and a lot, but only the prominent ones remain in my mind for that reason. My brain is meant to just process the information, get it out to you, and I'm supposed to be neutral. So I believe this uh, supports uh, the neutrality part of the interpreter that you shouldn't have any back story that hinders you from doing your job. The cultural part ro roar is, uh, is very, it comes to my mind here because uh, 
people are by default, uh, they tend to sympathize, they tend to connect more to people from their own culture. And as an interpreter, one, one person in the room at least will be from your culture. So the, your best bet is not to get, uh, so I'm, an, I'm Egyptian, uh, Kuwaiti slash Kuwaiti slash Turkish, some, some nationalities in me and some, a lot of cultures in me. So if you were going in a room with someone who I, I wasn't immersed in their culture, I wouldn't give you the best of the best. I would do, a lot of interpreters have gone out of their way, have been exposed, me too, have been exposed to thousands and thousands of calls. So we know about these things. But in mediation, it's not like medical. It's not like court or legal. It is completely different. The culture plays a very significant role. So you want me to come in, uh, we uh, to, to come in with no, um, with nothing in my background or nothing in my mind that will hinder me, hinder you from doing your job, you know? So retaining information and the cultural background and all of this contributes to that. You want me to be neutral. You want me to be culturally aware and of course, linguistic, uh, linguistically able to relay your message properly because we don't interpret, a good interpreter does not do a word for word. They have to do a meaning for meaning. So I want to take your meaning, relay it in the same intent, with the same tonality, with the same, if one of the people is angry, I'm angry. And if the other one is laughing, replying with the laughter, I have to reply with laughter. Uh, so we, you have to take the hat of every person in the room instantly while you're working. So it's already exhausting. I don't want to keep the information in my mind on top of that, you know? I think that's, Lord, this is something we have to discuss with her on this aspect, with you also. But I think that if, let's start with that joke part of it, because I'm just thinking that the end result was to make people laugh. So the end result was maintained, whether the actual content went out or not, was it important? So from the mediation perspective, Roar, how do you look at that? End result, laughter. What was said? I, yeah, I... I in my belief, uh, I think the interpreter did a great job uh, because to convene a, a joke that cannot, uh, you know, it's very difficult to 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 be transformed. Uh, I think he really uh, stepped in and and saved a situation uh, from my point of view, and then of course uh, from the linguistic point of view and, and your profession's uh, point of view, uh, you have your boundaries and we all have boundaries in, in the fields we are working. But I think in this cross elements that we see here, that you are stepping in and helping each other. And from my point of view, he was definitely helping Jimmy Carter save a situation where well, probably this joke had not been fun at all. Um, so that's that's my point of uh, of view on that case. Yeah. Well, I think that's something which is, like I said, from the mediation perspective also, sometimes is it required to pass on content to content or is it the end result is what you need? So I think that's an interesting aspect that we need to look at. Yes, Reen. But here, uh, Vikram, you want to think about, you're saying end result to end result. There is there's a lot of way to get your clients to sign a deal. A lot of way. You don't want your interpreter to just get you that end result. You want it to get it your way because I might get the end result of the signature, but still the feud is up and they're still bitter and they're still out to get each other, you know, by telling them if you don't, just twisting your message in one way or another. Uh, but you want your way, not the interpreter's way. And you you don't want the summarized version of the interpreter. You don't want you want you as you because no matter how immersed I get into mediation, I'll never be as good as you. It's your bread and butter, your day to day. It's not my day to day. Uh, so you might use some words or some uh, some form of. Uh, mediation concept that I see, uh, this is, from my point of view, this is useless. I shouldn't mention that. Or it's okay if I forgot that part. But for you, it's a very crucial piece. And I will never know when this, when does this happen, no matter how good we prepare, no matter how, how the conversation goes between us before. So you don't want the end result from the interpreter. You want the 
your actual message, meaning to meaning. If you tell me, someone would say, oh, he kicked the bucket. If I translate that and interpret it in Arabic, it will mean literally nonsense. But I, ha I know from my culture, there's another saying that conveys the same meaning that that person died. So I will say the saying and I will not, if I, if I don't know a saying, I will say this person died. So it's again, meaning to meaning, but not the end result. You know, I, uh, I what feel... I Mm -hmm. yeah. No, go ahead. No, I was just trying to get at the difference because yes, this aspect of the mediator and interpreter sometimes does come up, but I'm saying that the idea is not to exactly convey those words. It's the actual, how yeah. it has to go across and that is a different, maybe that's where the different role comes in. Because if they yeah. were, if this was word to word, then they could sit together and put it word together. Word, it was. Yeah, it was, use Google know. Translate, you know. <laughs> exactly. Just okay. Well, you want to say this? Just say this to that person. Or you want to say this? Say this to that person. No, but yeah. this is where we come in. I think so. That's a, the interesting filter where we have to decide how much you're filtering and what you're really putting across. I think that that I'm sorry, that was an interesting aspect of the difference which kind of came up. Where, and I think there that we are, we are moving from just the um, linguistic part of it to the cultural convener of uh, what it said and, and how it will be received on the other end. And, and you are both an expert in my, my mother language and the language with the party I'm having the conversation with. And in that, I think, the interpreter also would have a um, cultural understanding as the example that you showed, Reem, uh, how this will uh, need to be um, transferred. So the meaning comes out in the way you know that I wanted it to, to be brought, but I'm yeah. not aware of that. Um, so, so you are my helper, my assistant, in that cultural uh, understanding at the same time? Uh, one way an interpreter actually uh, can help in that aspect or can overcome this problem, uh, we always speak in first la first, uh, first person. So Roar and Vikram, you're speaking. I'm not saying Roar said to Vikram, Roar said one, two, three. I'm saying, I want you to do one, two, three. Uh, so, Stepping out of this role to be a clarifier, and I'm putting the labels on it because it helps to understand uh, how to evaluate the interpretation experience. Uh, you, I could easily say, hey, Ro, this is the interpreter speaking now. So now you know I'm not relaying any message and I'm asking you or clarifying to you, if I said that joke, people are not gonna laugh. Or if I, if you say it that way, it has a negative connotation in this culture. So a culture, a, cl a clarifier. Here again, it's a controversial part. Am I stepping out of my role? To Am I going out of my way to help my client? Or what am I doing here? But it, I cannot do this to the recipient, to the low language profession that I'm interpreting to. I cannot do that. I have to get back to you and ask you always. So a good interpreter, as we said, is invisible, but sometimes they have to have a voice and say something to, to help, especially when the, when the conversation is going on and on and on. And you know that the problem here is a cultural problem. They are going on and on and fighting about something that Merely, if you clarify this piece, the conversation will dissipate and this tension will dissipate. So if I'm in any situation like that, I feel I will feel obliged to get back to my client and clarify and give them a picture. Because as you said, I'm you were not the expert in the other language, nor the other culture. And I'm the one expert. And that's why you have me here. So that's why I believe this is what my client needs. They need to be aware of the surroundings, of the emotions, of the reason behind those emotions, those feelings. Uh, and there's a lot of like very, uh, very interesting examples in, in the cultural context. Uh, one of them is, uh, I don't know if you guys know about it, but the Hiroshima issue. Uh, I, the, the part where the, the president at that time when the US gave, gave their demands, 
And that, that president said no comment, but he said it in his language. And that word in his language could mean no comment or could mean let's ignore that. The same word, two meanings. And guess what the press picked up? Because they weren't the experts, they just translated what the, what the press picked up. They, they picked up the let's ignore it. So from a, this was one of the major or one of the biggest failures in interpretation and translation history that, ca that caused people to lose their lives. So because you took the cultural element out of it and you just added the linguistic, see what happens, let's ignore it or no comment. So the, the, you want someone to clarify that for you. You want someone to come and tell you this could mean either this or that, you know? So what do you do then? We are sitting in this mediation and then you just pause them and you yeah. take this parenthesis where you explain this to me and it kind of assists me in, are you sure you're going to take, uh, <laughs> are you sure I want, uh, you want me to, to interpret this joke? Or are you sure it's this is the meaning? So you yeah, kind of said, are you sure? I don't want to antagonize anyone. You know, <laughs> I would just say if I say that it might mean this, this, or it might have this impact, or it might be offensive because, especially between English and Arabic, there's a lot that is okay in English that is offensive for religious or cultural reasons. You know, if you go and in a very simple intake, medical intake form that everyone, when they go to the hospital fill, there's a question, uh, for example, are you sexually active? If someone uh, asked that to a female in the Arab region, oh my God, they, should, they start yelling at you on how offensive that is. And then the doctor will be, what's happening? I'm just asking a very simple question and you step in. So... I used to do, because I got used to this situation, before, oh, intake question, excuse me, ma'am, this is the interpreter, before we start, please expect X, Y, Z that might happen, so you would know, so you would be aware of the flow, so when the voice uh, raises, you know what's happening, you know, uh, there is a lot of cultural differences, so yeah, I clarify, so, but I don't say are you sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we, um, and I talk a lot about in my trainings, is the needed part of well preparation. And I, when I'm listening now, I can see in the use of interpreter in uh, multilinguistic negotiation or mediation, the need to be working well in advance together with you, to, um, to let you know my structure of it and, and the, the interest, the positions, the, what I want to, to try to achieve, uh, my boundaries. I want to involve you a lot in this so you are able to try to understand uh, the meaning because the meaning sometimes could be that I don't want this to be resolved today. My, my, my goal is status quo. I just want to show up, keep talking and not create anything. Um, so, so I want you to be involved in the whole situation before yes. we get started. So when we are working that's with our party, true. yeah, I think that's that's a total, uh, um, hundred percent needed. And then my question: How often is that happening? How often is that happening that oh. the parties bring on the interpreter early on and involve them? in the preparation into it it doesn't happen as often as we hope that it does because i believe the more we said interpreter is invisible we became literally invisible you know <laughs> so it doesn't happen that often but i sp specifically in business settings in uh, legal settings you want the interpreter to be recurrent. You want one or two interpreters to be on your team because it, it's not one session. It's, it's, it, it, it expands on a span of time. So you would need a frequent visits. Uh, we work on two models, on demand or pre-scheduled. People always choose on demand, uh, but now the interpreter comes in and you need to bring the interpreter up to speed because uh, to the interpreter at some point, 
you might be speaking gibberish. If I don't have a background of what's happening, I don't. I cannot interpret because one word in a context could mean a different in another context. So if I just picked up the phone and I got a mediation call, I don't even know. They don't like tell you, hey, interpreter, now we are in a mediation session and I have my, they don't tell you that. They, hey, interpreter, please start. And you just shoot, you know, and, and, and uh, you uh, introduce yourself and then they start talking. So it, it starts to make no sense at some point. And we get this a lot in legal calls. At some point when when we believe that the, the lack of information is affecting the interpretation, uh, the interpretation flow and the quality of the service delivered, we stop, we say, excuse me, client, please provide me with the back story of what's happening to be able to interpret better. Is this a customer service or is this a fight? What are we talking about? So the more you prepare your interpreter, the more your interpreter is involved and immersed in your experience with your clients, the more he knows about your clients, the more he will be able to give you the best out of, the, out of his uh, performance. So your advice to our profession as mediators and lawyers around is that involve, involve us, involve yes. the interpreter early, and not on demand, but more on a more consecutive uh, part. A pre scheduled part. Be it simultaneous, be it, pre, be, be it consecutive, whisper, whatever mood you want to choose uh, that will help you. Be, be as open to your interpreter as you would be to your assistant or your your wingman. Your, your interpreter is your wingman slash woman, you know. Uh, they will help you achieve the result. Without them, this conversation would not exist. So give them the give them uh, arm them with the knowledge, arm them with the background, uh, because they are representing you. They are speaking in your own voice. So you want again your own voice to be conveyed. So definitely prepare your interpreters and be aware of how to evaluate an interpreter, uh, because I believe. If people reach the step of mediation, they do want to resolve the conflict. If they got here, they want to resolve. And you don't want the quality of the interpretation to be the reason this doesn't happen. And this could happen and happens already. Um, if you just Google like um, uh, mess ups from interpreters in the political uh, world, you're going to see horror stories and people, interpreters who are working in a very prestigious positions and very sensitive positions. So be aware of how to choose your interpreter. Uh, cheap is not always good and it's not always bad, but you want to know if this interpreter uh, worked in your profession before or not, uh, if they are aware of the terminology. And if they're not aware, it's a very easy exercise where you send them the terminology, that the, the most complex terminologies you expect to use. Uh, be aware that an interpreter cannot omit what you're saying, cannot um, cannot add to what you're saying, cannot rephrase what you're saying. So how how well I don't understand the language would I pick up on these cues? So I always tell my clients that pay attention to the shrinkage and the expansion of language. This is the one thing that you can cue and you can understand even if you don't hear the language, if, even if you don't understand the language. Uh, there is a lot of resources online that tells you, like, if you if you transfer from English, convert it to Spanish, what will happen? Or convert it to Arabic, what will happen? Or vice versa. Be aware of this part, and it can give you a guide. And uh, if you if this is the first time it's uh, you're working with that specific interpreter, that specific company, make sure to understand what's their what's their quality assurance measurement. How do they train? Uh, how do they evaluate? It's very important to understand the evaluation criteria of an interpreter. Uh, so to get the best out of the interpreter, yeah. So as a mediator, yeah, so as a mediator, it's, you will definitely advise me that part of my preparation with my, with my two parties, it's also a well done preparation with the interpreter I want to hire. Yes. But I think the important thing that came out from what Reem said was, that this conversation would not have been happening without you. I think do people value mediators as much to understand this aspect? I think this is what is <laughs> what was the, the important thing that came out from there. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
we're overlooked a lot, Vikram. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The, the invisibility of the the person is not really the invisibility, but the fact that you can be visible, you're not, you're there, but you're not there kind of thing. That is where I think the value of mediators gets, gets lost. I think this is where the important thing for people to understand, because if mediation did not take off the way it should have taken off, I think this is one of the reasons for that. Because this yeah. communication, I mean, I'm, I like that sentence. I think we're going to use that sentence. <laughs> this communication would not have happened without you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, but I think one, one issue that, of course, I mean, the fact that you are going to be communicating, but at the same time, not bringing your views, your biases, obviously, all those things are not coming in to a certain extent. From the mediator's perspective, the neutrality part of it is a debate by itself. So, I mean, you are you looking at it as being part of a negotiation? If you're talking, if you're talking about negotiation aspect, you will end up you're part of a negotiation, and as an interpreter, obviously, you are not supposed to be involved in it at all. You're still there as someone just taking words from here to there, but putting it in the right context. But does it come in anywhere in your system that I'm part of this larger activity and Every what is day. It? Every day, Vikram. Imagine, imagine a hypothetical situation where you are, where, where I'm interpreting in a court hearing, for example. And I see that the low language proficient, the person I'm interpreting to, and I'm there for, for helping, they are, giving more information than they should. And I, this is not the question. You misunderstood the question. And I just mute myself and you cannot take a deep breath. We do breathing exercises. We do chair yoga. We do everything to keep ourselves calm uh, from, from not stepping in. At some point you reach, uh, uh, if you are a recurrent interpreter in a specific situation, you, you bond with, with the people you, you are around. And this is frowned upon. You're not supposed to have side conversation with anyone. You're not supposed to uh, answer any personal question, even if you're asked. If, you, if they ask you, where are you from? You're supposed to say, this is the interpreter speaking. Uh, I cannot answer this question. Please wait till your client come back or something like that. So keeping yourself neutral in the court situation, you know that this client that you bonded with, that you have seen throughout the whole experience and, and the misery they have been, and now they are giving a lot of information that volunteering it because they may be misunderstood your question or they may be, I, there's a lot of maybes here, but they misunderstood your question. You would wanna say, just answer the question. Don't, don't say, just answer with yes or no. Why are you telling your son's back story and how he grew up, you know? Uh, so it is, it is very hard to keeping neutrality. It's very hard to keeping the role boundaries on a daily basis. We are humans after all, we're not robots. We're not an AI that is interpreting. You get affected with the stories you hear. And the most people that needs interpretation in your world, they are businessmen, maybe they are uh, um, in, in the po uh, politics world. But for us, it's the refugees, it's the asylum seekers, it's the people who were moved. These are the most people we get calls from. So you hear horror stories. We're humans, we wanna be there, but we cannot. What about Roar? You were not part of the symposium on neutrality and mediation. I'm taking. I mean, maybe I'm taking it into a different direction, but not so much in a different direction. You're hearing things, and from there, uh, there everyone has a different way of looking at mediation. Also, what is really my role? How much am I going to be putting out there? Should I or should I not? How would you look at your role there? Neutrality is, you know, it's the it's the key element, and to be aware all the time how you balance uh, your your time uh, time with the parties uh, and also of course the neutrality of the information you you receive um, but I think also you don't want you said Reem, you don't want to be an uh, I, uh, AI or a robot uh, and I think that the human touch to it because that is a part where you build report with, with the parties and to be able to to create something in this negotiation or mediation and, and create something that maybe the parties haven't thought about before so you can get a result both can be living with. I think it's important to, to, to be there and, and be present, build report and 
but all the time have your neutrality. So then it's the question, how much do they need to know about you? How much do you need to open up to, oh, yeah. to make that happen? Um, but with great awareness um, and have, um, I will say, awareness and high ethical standard, um, I think you can expand that part so you are able to build the necessary report because I think that it's needed to be able to create an outcome with the, with the parties. So the assistant part, you are as a mediator. I also hear from the interpreter side, they are also the assistant. So I think we are you know, two professions that is both needed in those situations. I, and I believe when I've been listening to you now, need to work closer together to be able to make best out of each other to help our clients. Because my thought on neutrality is different. I don't really, really look at media to, to be neutral because I think there's a big issue there to be able to say that also. But, but I still feel that, I mean, of course, it's debatable. Like we had that debate. I mean, we, we will keep having that debate. It will go on. But, but I think the important thing for us is that how much like this power imbalances to a certain extent, Reem was talking about to a certain extent, whether that individual should have been saying all this kind of thing would put, put their case in jeopardy, maybe those sentences now in those kind of certain maybe power imbalances, let's talk about it. In those situations, of course, Reem, there are power imbalances in that room where you are. How do you handle that? Uh, you, you keep yourself together and you remain neutral. You don't say anything. You are, you know, I always remind myself, I'm a conduit and I can't, I'm like a tube. The information is going from one side and it's getting to the other side. That's all I'm here for it to do. It's the reaffirmation. It's keeping, uh, keeping the, perhaps he has a hidden agenda. You don't know. The, I'm talking about this story for me was about the human complexity of an interpreter and what they go through on a daily basis. The fights that you have to have inside of you. That day with my uh, with my patient that the story I opened with, uh, till today I question myself and I bring it up and I talk about it in, in our industry conferences and people are still opposed and uh, some are uh, with, you know, uh, it's just the, the humanity part. Only humans are able to understand human complexity. And let's say yet only humans, but this is this is where we at right now. So we understand our own complexity. But as again, going back to the invisibility of the interpreter, uh, we, we we are not given that uh, that luxury of having emotions and expressing them and uh, or saying anything about it. And you are not allowed to talk about it outside even of the call with your colleagues or vent or do anything. So it's very stressful. Uh, so if I and my client were recurrent, it makes it way easier. Uh, if this is like you, Roar is my client or Vikram and you're using the same interpreter and he understands so he understands how you feel, you understand how I feel and we're going back and forth in here. It makes, it, it, it elevates the, lo the load of the emotional stress on the interpreter. This interpreter, you have to think about where this interpreter comes from and what he does on a daily basis. You mediate or negotiate on a daily basis. This interpreter work in 20 different industries on a daily basis. From a banking call to a cancer call to a legal call to this to that, back to back. So they have to wear the auxillion hat on a daily basis. So imagine, imagine the, the toll and the emotional stress an interpreter could get into. From one, one call delivering a bad news to delivering a baby in the next call and going on and on and on about it. So already he, interpreters, I can say, they come with a baggage. So accept your interpreter's baggage and uh, be very, very open with your interpreter. If you, are, if you don't like an approach or you don't like something, communicate. We have different tools in our toolbox and we can shapeshift the way our clients want. This is what we, our the end goal and what keeps us intact <laughs> and our uh, minds uh, sane is that we want what our clients need. That's what we want. If you need me to be emotional, I get emotional. If you want me to be as frank and as open with you as possible, I will be. If you ask me after a, co a conversation, what do you think this, what the, the tension in the room or the energy in the room was because 
I'm not going to give you an answer because you don't want me to do that. That's that's think- the. No, but I'm just thinking the human ream because we are still expecting the human ream to be in that room. <laughs> so how do you react when you see a situation when you're saying you really want to say how can you even do this to this person? How can you even say what happens in that situation? God bless the person who invented the mute button. <laughs> God bless them. You know, I do. You, if you are on site. Imagine that you can, you also need to keep your, your facial expressions in place. You know, you cannot like, what did you, you can do anything with your, with your face. What do I do? The affirmations. This is what we do. You are a conduit. You are not here to express your emotions. It's not your place. And sometimes you're human. You, you mess up. You get out of it. Perhaps my, my story, I got out of my, my role. And that's, that wasn't supposed to happen. It happens, but a good interpreter, this is part of our training, by the way, our psychological training. We do psychological training for interpreters uh, to how to deal with the stress. We have uh, what we call a social decompression for interpreters, where take all this emotion that you piled up during your uh, interactions and vent it in a safe space where you do not breach any, uh, viol- you don't breach any code of conduct or anything and come express what happened to you here. We do this regularly every two weeks for our interpreters. And some, there's a lot of forms where you come and vent. One of the, one of, one company has a helpline for interpreters where after you end a call and you want to let that energy out because you couldn't do it on a call, you go into the helpline, you talk to someone and you get out. But again, you need to keep neutral. We don't have any other option. Because Roar, we are going to now look at it from the mediator's perspective. And all the all these things that she said, because mindfulness for mediators, reflective practice groups for mediators, we are, I, I'm putting all that together because I think we, we need it as much to a lot of things. But how do you... Yeah. Definitely. I, when I hear that the compression um, boot camp that you will uh, have, I think that is something both for mediators and, and lawyers, uh, you know, that those stressful situations, uh, you, you have um, your roles or what you need to keep for yourself and, and you cannot discuss with others. I think that's a big need to be able to decompress uh, in a safe space um, so that it, so your industry have made that I think that's a great part of it and for the from the mediators point of view if you are not co-mediator you are there by yourself and and having a lot and a lot of information uh, feelings uh, understand the situations the parties are in about neutrality keep that neutrality when you feel that maybe you have more sympathy towards one of the parties than the other but what is then your role you need to then step back into what is your role yeah you are there as a helper you are there as a facilitator to help these parties bring this conflict uh, to uh, to um uh, yeah to solve that conflict um, but yeah. we won't, yeah, because the only thing is, look, resolving a, a resolving based on, I, mean, I don't know whether we have, it's part of the topic here or not, but the fact that resolving it in any power imbalance situation, the you you know there's a gun on the head of someone else, and you are just communicating things which you know that this person is in a situation may may accept, and you want to close it and say yes, this person will accept it. But looking at it from your perspective, you know this is an issue here. There are there is a power imbalance, like I said. In those situations, how are you handling that aspect? Are you coming in as the human roar? Are you coming in as just I'm a I'm just a conduit, as Reem said? How are you looking at yourself, your role? Um, to both to, to use all the tools that we have in in the box uh, and part of you know reframing and questioning acknowledging knowledge uh, acknowledging feelings etc but also what do we talk about in plenary sessions and what do we talk about in private meetings or caucuses and how much more can i um be working with the, one of the parties in the caucus 
and maybe be more challenging, uh, help them to, to um, not help them in expressing it, but help them with using tools uh, that you could uh, advise them to, to use um, when you are talking with them in a private meeting and try to you know distance um, go to the balcony see the situation from the outside and help the party with um, changing perspectives um, i think that is uh, one of the biggest challenges and the involvement of the mediator i think it's very important to be involved and work with them and, and not just be the distanced uh, mediator standing out there and, and um, you know, um, shuttling diplomacy, moving back and forth in a way that I can translate the interpreter's role in many situations when you are, you know, bringing the, the meaning back and forth. But as mediator, work more with the parties, involved with them, but at the same time, Vikram, uh, be very much aware of your neutrality so you're not becoming biased towards one of the parties. Because I tell you, Rory, you'll hear uh, I mean, all my events. A lot of them, these three words come in. I'll just use two of them. I keep using heart, soul, spirituality. I'll just use, because we're talking about language. So I'm saying language of the heart, language of the soul. Those, those languages fit in. Reem said, look, I am to keep that particular face and everything for her as an interpreter. She has her limitations, maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm still. It's is it debatable? I don't know from her perspective. She'll tell it's us. Not. It's not. It's I not. I want, but it's not. I want it to be debatable. Yeah. But, it's not. but from the mediator perspective, it's still debatable. I'm still. I mean, I mean, I've opened that discussion, and it's always debatable. The language of the heart and the soul. Let's get Reem in. From the mediator perspective, she's not just an interpreter. She's also giving us from the mediator perspective. Vareem, from the mediator perspective, heart, soul. I, I, it's hard to say, but you can, I would say there is no neutrality in a mediator. There is no way you're neutral. This, this I agree on. You, you come and you have your, you're human. So you have your set of thoughts feelings, and you cannot just deny them. If you're a really good uh, uh, mediator, uh, you wouldn't want yourself to be disconnected from the human aspect. And heart and soul makes a human. So you're not neutral, but there's a difference between using, I think from my linguistic perspective too, there's a difference between saying neutral and unbiased. You, cannot, you can uh, be unbiased, but you cannot be neutral. Because I come in, I like, I like this person more. He's more decent, or he's giving a good energy. Whatever I, my my thoughts and beliefs are, but and the other person is very rude to me or to to the whole situation. Of course, as a human, I will lean more towards that nice person. Just my mind will take me there automatically. I snap myself out of it and I'm, I'm not a mediator. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, logically speaking, from a spiritual uh, aspect, you can never detach yourself. You're still human. You can never detach yourself. So, Lord, these two words, heart, soul, and then spirituality. She, she brought in spirituality. I didn't, <laughs> but the spiritual aspect <laughs> is important. <laughs> language of the heart, language of the soul, where do you fit in? How do you look at that from your perspective? I, I believe you um, to be biased. I think that's normal. Um, and but you need to question yourself uh, about why you are biased. Um, and I, I don't believe that we are able to take that out, as you said. Uh, you are a human, um, but you need to ask yourself why am I biased uh, to that person and. Why is that happening? And then be aware of your reactions and how you involve and maybe not involve yourself with that person in this mediation role. Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's needed to both use the heart uh, and uh, what was the phrase? The heart and the brain was it? Heart soul soul oh. heart, heart soul. soul. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you I one thing. That, yeah. No, no. Please. I think you need to, to use them both. 
to be uh, the whole person because that is also creating that report that is so needed. Yeah. No, but I'm just thinking maybe the symposium should have started, every session should have started with people telling us what they think is mediation to start with, because yes. mediation itself is the blind man and the elephant situation. So Reem, you, Roar, me, maybe they are, we understand mediation differently. And if our starting point is different, then obviously everything that we say after that is connected to that. So maybe let's start with that. Reem, what is mediation? <laughs> <laughs> I have experienced the mediation and I started my, my understanding of mediation is uh, first of all, it's a peace making exercise or, or, or it, it's, a, it's something where, where I need when I don't want a situation to fester. And it's about more, more into emotion, less into legal. So if you if you bring legal jargon into a mediation, this is my understanding. You lost uh, the the ground you, because people are already very very uh, anxious. So mediation is a peacemaking tool with less legal jargon than arbitration, for example. I would say so. Yeah, that's my very very short take on that. <laughs> Before we get Roar in, Roar wants to know how much time we have. Roar, Roar, totally up to you. <laughs> Totally up to you. For me, yeah, with me, you. I don't know whether you know, but there have been sessions. Longest has been four hours and I think nine minutes. But three, three and a half have been there. <laughs> Two has been there. One and a half has been there. 30 minutes has been there. Everything. Totally up to you. So what do you say? How much time do we have? I think we uh, may be close in at about five minutes time. No wish, totally. So, Roar, what is mediation to you? Then maybe we get the language part of it there. Mediation is um, it's um, assisted um, strategic communication process. So when the parties are not able to yeah, communication. communicate well with each other, they need a third party to come in and help them uh, convene the message, uh, help them to facilitate it, uh, bring them to uh, different stages and be aware of all the elements that is affecting uh, the person, um, but have a, a goal of helping them to figure out the fundament. Is it possible to reach an agreement or should we find other ways to solve it? Well, as someone thinking. from the, sorry, sorry, Vikram, as someone from the outside, uh, when I was talking to Roar, when we met uh, in Dubai, uh, I told him, I feel like mediators, you guys are therapists to a, to a festering situation, you know? The way we spoke, the way uh, you look at things, the way you analyze things, uh, you're a therapist, um, honestly. <laughs> so I think, but that's again, the same thing about how do people look at mediation? Because some people don't look at it that way. They look at it as a very sterile, some people look at a very sterile atmosphere and you are just, I mean, just sitting there to just, okay. I mean, just sitting there. I mean, I would just say it like that. Just sitting there. <laughs> and the other one is you're more involved. The other part, another one is the emotion part of it. Do you bring it in, not bring it in? So they're all options available. I just want to limit it because for every, whatever works for whoever is perfectly all right for them. But only thing that we need to do is that where does AI, because AI is coming in and you know, being an interpreter or being a mediator, where does that fit in so that your role is it there beyond once we get into AI becoming as smart as it is becoming now? Do you see a role for the interpreter? And then we look at the mediator. Roar will tell us about the mediator with AI being where it is and going where it is. Yeah, well, if we're talking about interpreters in general, uh, no, there is no way, at least at least uh, in, in our lifetime for AI to take over because uh, I, I started with saying only humans understand human complexity. 
uh, AI is a good tool. I love it. I use my ChatGPT every day. It, it's it's really good, but you cannot replace humans in a human interaction. Uh, and AI, no matter how good it gets, no matter how far it gets, it is still as good as the information it's fed. So an AI can be discriminator, racist, uh, as, uh, sexual. They can be whatever, as much information as you put. We don't know who's putting. Again, it's humans putting those information. So it's still human, you know. Uh, so it, as in interpretation, specifically in the legal and medical uh, aspects, you can never uh, eliminate the human factor from it. It has to always be moderated because it's not only about the culture and the language, it's about the culture, the language and the emotions. I always say it's like an equation. You cannot take one out of the other in interpretation and in cultural adaptation. Uh, so an AI as immersed as they get into cultures, you feed them information about cultures, but there's street nuances that you will, if I, the AI, uh, I don't know what they are called, the, the people who operates the AI, if I don't get the right information, the wrong information is the output. So no. no but, but look at it from this perspective, be it from interpreter perspective or mediator perspective, where are we feeding them information if everything is confidential? We are not even letting them into those rooms. And if we don't let them into the rooms, how will they learn? So are we going to look at maybe let's give some machines access to what's happening in, in, to, in those rooms for them to learn? Are we going to do that? Well, that's yeah, Reem is coming in the role will obviously tell us what he thinks about AI. Are we letting them in or not? How are they going to learn? We should. We don't want an AI uprising on our hand. Our generation has suffered enough. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that's enough, you know. Okay. Uh, we we don't want it's not only we don't want that but so in a legal situation there's always precedence and there's always a first time thing and there's always a, a judging to a situation as it arises in situations like that when there is no backstory where you are uh, bringing something from left and right and from the north and the south the ai would do that in a, in a way where there's no emotions it's it's an algorithm of emotions which cannot replicate the soul, the spiritual part and the emotion and the connection and the cultural emergent and all of the, it's it's very complex. Humans are very complex. So, okay, so heart, soul, spirituality came that. up. Yeah, heart, soul, spirituality came in somewhere. So I'm very happy that we, we still have humans there. But only yeah. thing, but Ror, look at it from this perspective that everyone doesn't have Ror to be a mediator to be able to give people access to the best in relation to mediation, do we need to train AI? And maybe if the aspect of heart soul is taken out, because a lot of people don't bring it in into mediations, and they, that's their way of looking at it. In that sense, should it be a direction that can or will people want it to move? How, I don't know, whatever you think of that. I I, I believe that in, in some cases, um, it could be a great benefit. Uh, the, the case is um, uh, many move into the monetary part, and it's, it's, uh, it's a big question about the division of the monetary element that is, and it's no... Um, not much feeling. I'm, I'm angry, of, of course, because this has happened, but but my feelings towards the other party is more related to this clear case monetary division of it. And use AI in a situation that we can predict. This has happened in several cases from before. This is a predicted outcome in a situation that what we have of the input into this, um, it could be a great tool uh, to to use. And maybe to yeah, use... As an aid. In, Yes, as an aid and maybe a first step in towards uh, a real mediation. So we can say that this is a predictable outcome from the cases that we know that we have had before. And But I, I'm a believer of human connection and, and, and the communication between the parties. So we are able to leave this conflict in full, not just get the result, but, but leave the conflict and 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 go on with the life. Uh, but not all cases are like that. Some cases are much more limited. Other cases are uh, 
uh, larger, where you have the huge, large um, uh, human aspect of it. And as an aid, definitely. Uh, but maybe in a few cases, it can be used solely. Uh, but I think, and I believe the human touch in this matter is great. But please give me three more minutes because I just wanted to get Reem in because she used a word which was good, which was the energy. There was something about energy in the room, something about that. Communication happening in words and the energy. What have you felt about the energy in the room and how is that has taken the... Let's Here we look talking about maybe a negotiation happening or that in that kind of situation. What have you felt there? Have you felt something there? Are you asking about right now or generally in immediate Generally, have you no in yeah in any kind of a space that you've been and and because I really want to get into the energy part of it because I do speak about that a lot but let's get your personal experience because you've been in lots of rooms <laughs> of different kinds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have been uh, definitely. Uh, I'm a person who feeds on energy and I, and uh, I connect with energy and I understand and I always analyze people from how I'm feeling about them uh so yeah i've i've been i experienced those uh situations where interpretation situation where i was uncomfortable in a room for no reason but the negative vibes that was emitting there you feel from the energy the body language the, uh, the tonality everything as an interpreter because you are there to observe you have to observe this is your role so you have to see the the cues that the people are making and uh, when you are in video or on site uh, and then as an over the phone you get your senses very heightened because you need to get every your visual uh, aspect is not working with you so you need to get your ears up and your heart and everything into it to be able to work very well so yeah you you get the vibes and uh, you feel the energy and it to some extent it could affect the the uh, the interpretation encounter flow uh when when an interpreter is an uncomfortable that's why we tell the uh, our uh, our interpreters that if you're uncomfortable in a situation that hinders you from doing your job excuse yourself from this assignment and get someone else well not... thank you yeah. mm -hmm. No, but I'm just thinking, have you been able to shift the energy? Because I'm going to ask Roar the same thing, because the energy part is another thing that, have you been able to shift the energy? Uh, I, one situation came, uh, came to my mind when you said shift the energy. It was after maybe more than 30 minutes of nonsense that was happening. Uh, and I know, and uh, everyone was frustrated and everyone was angry, uh, be, but silent angry, not like, yelling at each it was silent frustration and i understood what where the frustration was coming from uh and because i was extremely exhausted emotionally from what was happening i stepped into my client and i said is this one two three four five six what you want your your client to know is this what you're trying to say and she's like oh my god you put it in a way better form than what i've uh, what i intended thank you so much please go tell them that this situation just came to my mind when you said shifting energy, uh, but you don't get to do that quite often now because some clients do tell you, interpreter, mind your own business. A lot. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, Roar, anything about the energy and the energy that the mediator brings in and how that shifts things? I think it's a crucial part of a mediator to shift energy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's yeah, yeah. I think you know, um, I often say that it's about the sensitivity. You know, you need to be sensitive to the atmosphere. And and when you feel this is going uh, the wrong way, you need to, to shift that gear and you are the assistant, you are the helper uh, in that situation. And it's that's why you need, I in my belief, a lot more than. Um, the, the strictly rational aspect into this. If this is technology or law or economic, it's about humans. Whatever the conflict it is about, it's humans sitting there. And you, in your role as mediator, I think it is to, to, to sense that energy and to do your foremost to, to shift that energy uh, because they are hired you to try to solve a situation and to bring that back to what is happening uh, in the plenary session and maybe take a step back and uh, and reframe how you 
are feeling the situation is happening. From your point of view, that could be done in a plenary session. And when you are working with people in a private meeting, it's a great sense to try to reframe what you have heard in the example you just gave, Reem. It is the same for us. I have heard you say someone so and so. In my view, I hear this and that. And this, that way you can help the party uh, vocalize their feelings because you are the professional part of it and, and you are there to assist them and help them to, to say, put words and, and vocalize maybe what they try to express but not are able to, to put out in a way that is practical or, or helpful for them. But that is your part of bringing energy into that conversation. Because how I'm looking at it is, again, why mediators may not be valued the way they are, because no one has ever gone out and understood the energy that they bring in. Have the, has the communication, has the language changed because of the presence of the individual? How do you even gauge that? How does anyone even give you feedback on that? Because that's something, it's just there. It's an abstract concept maybe there. But it is, for me... An important part. So I think that's what I'm saying. Even I'm connecting it to the topic because we are talking about language and mediation. The language in the room based on the energy of the mediator on this end. Of course, Reem will tell us on the interpreter. I don't know about that part. She will tell us whether that makes a difference or not. But do you think that Reem does it make a difference on both it ends? It does, of course. Humans, again, we are humans, you know, we are there. If I'm affected, if I'm negative, if I'm coming into your mediation session and I just had a fight on the street or whatever, I'm going to come and I'm going to affect the flow. Even if I'm not, it's not in my words, it's not in my messaging, it's not in anything, it's in my energy. I'm, I'm coming with this angry or this charged energy in me and you're going to see it affecting the flow or people will be un, at unease sitting around me, you know, uh, and I'm a loud and I always say I have a loud energy. Me as Reem, I have a very loud energy. If I'm mad, everyone around me gets mad for some reason. If I'm happy, everyone is happy, you know, so that's that's your interpreter. But again, as part of our uh, neutrality, uh, you have to come in in an energy neutral, you know, you have to, especially on site. On OPI, God bless again the mute button, but in on site, there is no that feature. So you have to come. So the, we have breathing exercises to do. We have some meditation exercises that we teach our interpreters. We have, we the chair yoga is our best friend. The chair yoga is what helps us get out of our mind. In two seconds, just shift your mindset because you don't want to affect your client's uh, outcome. And uh, this conversation brought something into my mind for mediators, actually. Uh, even if you have a good interpreter with a good cultural background and everything, I believe part of your preparation into a multicultural uh, mediation session should be a cultural immersion training or some of some sort for you as a mediator. As much as you trust your interpreter, your interpreter doesn't have your instincts, doesn't have your cues. Uh, and the interpreter is not going to tell you how to shake hands or who to look at first or where to see, sit first. Or he's not going to tell you that. If it, he should, like, you should have this conversation and he should know. But you need, as a mediator, to successfully uh, close uh, a conflict is to be immersed in the culture one way or another. Uh, so think about cultural immersion for mediators in this uh, part. Okay, so now, but Rohr's energy tells me that he wants to leave. But yeah. Rohr, <laughs> do you, you want to just conclude if you want, just a little conclusion on what's... I, um, my, my conclusion, I, I totally agree with, with Reem in her conclusion there, but I also see the, the, the um, collaboration uh, between the interpreters and the mediators in the situations that we are talking about, they could be a much closer. And for me, again, it's about preparation, get to know each other and, and work closely together uh, and not just give you a call and you show up uh, two minutes before the meeting and just translate the words for me, but with, with the meaning behind and understand where I come from and you to me, I think that is the great way 
that we need to work closer together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my, co my conclusion for it is think as the interpreter uh, or the, any, the language expert in general, because there's interpreters, translators, localizers, cultural adapters. There's a lot into the language industry. Think about them as an opportunity for you, an opportunity for success, for expansion. Uh, if you have an interpreter uh, uh, as, a, as your partner, not in one language, but you have multiple interpreters on your uh, call list, you have a countless opportunities in those markets because now the language and the cultural barrier is, uh, is eliminated for you. So think about them as part of your team and not as someone who's giving you a service as part of your team because you're helping you succeed in many aspects in tapping into new markets and into successfully uh, leading a mediation and get them prepared, get yourself prepared because it is a challenge to have a multicultural, multilingual uh, conversation in mediation, I believe. Okay, so give me just one second. I don't know whether I took it up before that. On mediatorvikram.com, you find information on what's happening. Roar and I contributed to this book. So that was, uh, of course, Mediation Beyond COVID. And there's information on this site. On all, all Now there are more than 500 videos. When we started the symposium, I said it's... I'm almost 500. Now we have 500 videos. So for people to find information, they'll find that. Roar, we have to set up a Norway mediation circle, which has to happen. Of course, Egypt and Turkey also, please dream, be part of the mediation world. You bring in everything that a mediator has. You've, what you've spoken about is everything that's that's required. Communication on one end, heart, soul, spirituality, energy, everything's taken care of after that. <laughs> All, everything can thank happen. you so much definitely to be in my honor uh, so, thank you so thank you very much both of you and of course 21st last day we have the learnings and key takeaways session and then ken cloak session so please same zoom link please drop in and thank you very much thank you so thank much you. thank you vikram thank you everybody have